I really didn't want to go. I didn't want to see them lower him into the ground in the spot he picked out with his dad. And I didn't want to see his parents sink to their knees in the dew-wet grass and moan in pain. And I didn't want to see Peter Van Huren's alcoholic belly stretched against his linen jacket. And I didn't want to cry in front of a bunch of people. And I didn't want to toss a handful of dirt onto his grave. And I didn't want my parents to have to stand there beneath the clear blue sky with its certain slant of afternoon light, thinking about their day, and their kid, and my plot, and my casket, and my dirt. She had walked about a third of a mile when the headlights of a car bore down on her. She stepped quickly off the road and ducked in some bushes. The car drove ten feet more, then screeched to a halt. Ivy scrambled to get deeper into the bush. The driver suddenly extinguished his bright lights, and she could see the shape of a car in the moonlight. A Honda. Will's car. She wanted to rush out of the bushes and into his arms, but she held back. Her mind raced, trying to think what she could tell him without spilling the whole and dangerous truth. There are several other weak spots in the fence, but this one is so close to home, I almost always enter the woods here. As soon as I'm in the trees, I retrieve a bow and sheath of arrows from a hollow log. Electrified or not, the fence has been successful in keeping the flesh eaters out of District 12. Inside the woods, they roam freely, and there are added concerns like enormous snakes, rabid animals, and no real paths to follow. But there's also food, if you know how to find it. My father knew, and he taught me some before he was blown to bits in a mine explosion. Even though trespassing in the woods is illegal and poaching carries the severest of penalties, most people would risk it if they had weapons. But most are not bold enough to venture out with just a knife. My bow is a rarity, crafted by my father along with a few others that I keep well hidden in the woods, carefully wrapped in waterproof covers. In the fall, a few brave souls sneak into the woods to harvest apples but always in sight of the meadow, always close enough to run back to the safety of District 12 if trouble arises. District 12, where you can starve to death in safety, I mutter. Then I glance quickly over my shoulder. Even here, even in the middle of nowhere, you worry someone might overhear you. I sit at my drawing board with a pencil in my hand and a sheet of white paper before me. I close my eyes and all I can think of is red. So I get a tube of watercolor. Cadmium red dark. And a big mop of a brush. And I fill a jar with water and I begin to cover the paper with red. It glistens. The paper is limp with moisture and it darkens as it dries. I watch it drying. The smell of gum Arabic. In the center of the paper, very small, in black ink, I draw a heart. Not a silly valentine, but an anatomically correct heart. Tiny. Doll-like. 
and then veins, delicate road maps of veins that reach all the way to the edges of the paper that hold the small heart enmeshed like a fly in a spider web. See? There's his heartbeat. The girl shot up into a sitting position. As she sucked in a huge breath, her eyes snapped open, and she blinked, looking at the crowd surrounding her. Burning blue eyes darted back and forth as she took deep breaths. Her pink lips trembled as she mumbled something over and over indecipherable. Then she spoke one sentence, her voice hollow and haunted, but clear. Everything is going to change. Thomas stared in wonder as her eyes rolled up into her head and she fell backward onto the ground. Clutched in her hand was a wadded piece of paper. Thomas moved to get a look. Scrawled across the paper in thick black letters were five words. She's the last one, ever. 